always appreciate the opportunity to come down and the topics and stuff I cover are usually <coughs> obtuse and all over the place. But what I'm going to end up going through is really a um, networking presentation, really specifically about how to isolate exactly what you want, how to meet people, how to describe what it is you do. All right, this will be somewhat interactive. I promise not to ask you tough questions or uh, embarrass you too much. But what I start out talking about is the topic I actually do is called isolation is a good thing. All right? And there's a specific reason. And part of what we're going to do, some of this that we're going to go through is a little bit of psychology. We're going to cover how to begin with the end of mind, something called a tornado technique, deflect the firm flows, referral currency, how to call a referral for an introduction. We're going to cover a lot of things in sequence. But when you say isolation, what comes to your mind? Depression, right? This is, this is what our mind pictures when we say words. This is what's unique about storytellers. When you guys are becoming storytellers, a single word can create something. So isolation by definition means the act of being alone, complete separation from somebody with a contagious disease, act of being quarantined or process why, where an idea or memory is divested from its emotional component. Now none of those things sound very good. This is how easy it is to reframe your own psychology or the stories that you tell. The single word isolation, we're going to instantly reframe it in your mind for the rest of your life. Ah, <laughs> isolation is a good thing. Just the single picture, when you say isolation, if you think of a picture like this as opposed to the other one, you can instantly retrain and reframe the way you feel inside your body. So understand storytelling is not only about pictures, but it's about the emotion. So we're going to create a new definition of isolation. Complete and utter focus, specific and clearly defined goals, and without leaving doubts of intent. So we're reframing isolation to be something that's now a good thing, and we're going to get really focused and specific. Here's what you need to realize. The only things you can control in life are your actions and your attitude. Come on, work. Your actions and your attitude. Your actions on what you do on a daily basis and your attitude towards the things that are happening around you, those are the only two things you really have control over. Everything else is external. You can't control the markets. You can't control what people do. You can control your actions and attitudes towards the things that happen on a daily basis and those responses. The difference between success and failure is really small. And this is a, it's a kind of a blurry slide, but I like it. It says, it doesn't matter how many resources you have. If you don't know how to use them, they'll never be enough. Learn how to use the tools available to you. This is kind of a little mission impossible for those of you that have seen it, but it's not mission impossible. It's mission I am possible. And this is a question I, I'm, who knows who this is? Still on. From what movie? All right. I'm not, I'm getting old enough that sometimes some of the references I make in a class people don't get. All right, so you guys have seen Rocky. One best picture. Well, all right, and this is a film class, so you never know. But here's the other thing. This is kind of a, a picture, if you can see, I don't know what it says. Up top it says your idea is just a glimmer. What's happening when you start creating ideas and companies, it's in your mind. Right? It's a glimmer in your mind, but it's kind of blurry and it's not well focused. And you can see it, but nobody else can. So you got to figure out how do I isolate what I want and how do I get really specific and then can you stay focused? This is a fun graph if it works. It spins. This isn't an animation. It's actually an illusion. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick a single black dot, any dot, stare at it and tell me what happens. Everything stops. There's power in this, guys. What this is saying is around you the world is spinning like crazy. And I didn't tell you which dot to pick. Every one of you picked your own dot. I didn't say pick this one. You need to pick a single point of focus, and when you stop and focus, the world around you can stop spinning. But you've got to figure out how to focus and how to get things to stop. Have they seen Alice in Wonderland? She says, which road do I take? Alice asks, and the cat with a grin says, where do you want to go? She goes, I don't know. Then any road will get you there. doesn't matter, right? This is when people say, I want to be successful. There's no definition. Right? I want to do this. I want to do that. How do you define where you want to go? One of the first things we're going to set, 
Start with a couple other things. What are your values? Now I like this one because every action has an opposite, opposite and equal reaction. And what I mean by that is if we go through these, you guys can help me fill in the blanks if you, if you know. Birds of a feather flock together, <clears throat> but opposites attract them. Your word is your bond. bond, but don't believe everything you hear. hear. You can't be C, but it's a juxtaposition here. You have to see it too. Believe it. But looks can be deceiving. Fish are cut. This is an old one, see? This is an older one. Or fake it till you make it. Make it. A couple of my favorites. Here's two quotes. We're going to go through the quotes and see if you know who they are. Some people know this. So everybody's a genius, but depending on how you judge them, it can think it's stupid. Who said that? Albert Einstein, I believe. Albert Einstein. Good job. Who said this? Einstein. So here's a different one. Two things are infinite. The universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the universe. Who do you think said this one? Einstein. Douglas Adams. No. <laughs> Hang on. See, if you guys have been following this, you would realize Einstein. the person Einstein. that said this was Einstein. Einstein. Everybody's a genius, but everybody's stupid. So no matter what your values are, you've got to figure out how do you believe in something and how do you root your values in that. And not everybody's going to believe you. Not everybody's going to have faith. Not everybody's going to have the same position or values or belief or understanding. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be people that are on the opposite side. Doesn't mean you're right or wrong. Just figure out what your beliefs are. Figure out your values. A couple things to be successful. It takes vision. For people to follow you, see this. But if you don't know where you're going, <laughs> might not be a good leader. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Well, the next one I don't think is any better. <laughs> Takes discipline to be successful. A little bit of planning. All right. And the last one for planning. These are just fun little pictures. Make sure little planning before you take off and jump in, or before you jump, make sure you know where you're going to land. This is what your life is like when you guys start after school. You're jumping into a world of crocodiles. People are out there trying to eat you, so just have some planning, have some fortitude. We're going to start moving into some tactical stuff. How do you set goals? How do you be specific? How do you isolate what you need to be successful, what you want to be successful? How do you identify what you need to move ahead? How do you create a vision of what your success is? And how do you learn how to articulate that vision to others? There's a lot of steps in there. And the first one is... What's called begin with the end in mind. How many of you guys have set goals? How many of you have 10 year goals? How many of you think your goals are specific? Okay, good. I'm not going to ask you what they are. We're going to move through it. So, what I like to do is I start with what I call a 10 year goal. And the first 10 year goal, there's a bunch of different things you want to start out with. But one of the first ones I start out with is how many of you have thought about being financially independent? All right. How many of you know what that number is? to be financially independent. Interesting, you guys can't see. Some hands went up on financial, it's like, yeah, we think about it. What's that number? Well, I don't know, but I want to get there. Right, any road will get you there. $3 to somebody in Bangladesh, they're pretty close. $3 here to buy you a cup of coffee. So one of the first things you do, rightly or wrongly, I'm gonna show you why we focus on financial independence as a number in our mind. And what I want you guys to do is say, all right, if I was 10 years out from right now, all right, I'm not going to go five. I think it's too short. 20 is too long. Let's say 10 years. If, if in 10 years you could have enough money saved to live off the interest to maintain a standard of living, that's how you define financial independence. So if you say, wow, I want to make you know, $200,000 a year. I need to make $15,000 a month, $180,000, whatever that number is. Go, all right, I need $200,000 a year to have that. I need at least X amount of money. I probably need $3 million at 8%. That gives me 240000 Yeah, if I had $3 million saved and I lived off that interest, I'd be financially independent. Does that make sense? All right, so I'm not going to tell you guys what that number is, but this is an exercise you guys can do later. I'll send you all this. So the first idea is how do you come up with that number and go, what do I want my number to be? And you're specific. And then what I want you to do is go, all right, that number... And don't be embarrassed about how big it is because we're about to do something different. Go, all right, it's three million or five or ten or a hundred. It doesn't matter. Go, that's enough for me. And I want you to go, that is selfish. 
This is where it's a trick with your mind and your psychology because people think money is bad. All right? I'm a big proponent. Money makes you more of what you already are. If you're nice and generous and you have money, you're, you can be really nice and generous. And if you're an ass, you are a big ass with money. All right? So just understand, if you had X amount of money, then ask yourself, go, if I had this and could survive, wow, but if I had more, what would I do for my mom and dad? Do I have a brother and sister? You know, do you have nieces and nephews? Do you have schools you want to give back to? Do you have charity? Like, if you go, well, this was enough for me, but wow, if I had more, what specifically would I do? Would you retire your parents? Would you set up a college fund? Would you donate to schools? Would you create charities? Would you send anonymous checks off to people? And you play with this weird thing in your mind. It's called a shift. And a shift says three million is enough for me, but if I had ten, wow, look what I could do for others. And you create this shift in your mind where a number becomes something of service to others. So then it's not about you. It's part of a bigger picture. And it starts changing your emotion and your psychology. And so step one is let's figure out a number and then let's shift to a bigger number. Now you say, all right, I'm on top of a mountain. I'm 10 years out. I've got this financial wealth. What do I want my life to be like? As I turn around and look at the last 10 years, and this is where you start getting specific. What kind of people do you want to be around? You know, some people like athletes and entertainers. Some people like business owners. Some people like, you know, homeless. Some people like creatives. Do you want a product or a service? You know, do you want to be a producer or director? Do you want to be a producer that did these kinds of, of films? Do you want to win these kinds of awards? Do you want to travel? Do you not want to travel? Do you want to travel with the family? Do you not want... It's like you start creating this criteria that says, here's all the things. If I had this, my life would be amazing. What kind of family do you want? Where do you want to live? What kind of house? Houses, one, two. It doesn't matter. This is just an exercise. And as you go through this list, product, service, consumer, business, be specific. As specific as you can. It's like when people say, I want to go on vacation. And I go, where do you want to go? How many people want to go on vacation? Let's do this as a, as a test. Where do you want to go? New Zealand. Okay. Argentina. New Zealand. All right, you guys at least have... A, a, a start. Sometimes I'll have people go, I, I don't care, I just want to go somewhere warm. So, great. You're in Afghanistan in the summer. <laughs> no, no, I want to be on a beach. Okay, fine, you're in Lebanon. <laughs> I heard they have beautiful beaches. you got to kind of duck from the bombs. Well, no, I want to be on a, a, a beach in Hawaii. Okay, do you want to live in a hut? Do you want to stay in a hotel? It's like, I want to go to New Zealand. I'd love to visit these cities. I'd want to go through these... It's, it's just that extra layer below of being specific that you start creating in your mind. Because what happens when you have a list, this allows you to manage your decisions better moving forward. When you guys leave, if you had a list like this, and you had five opportunities presented to you as you leave school, one might be a job, two might be a documentary, one might be a feature film, one might be working in a studio. And they're all great opportunities. And you've got your degree and you're being presented these things and you have to look and go, wow, well this one pays me this much money, this one pays me a little less, this one gets me with a bunch of creative. You look at your five opportunities and you project them into a list of what you want your life to be like. And all of a sudden you're measuring your opportunities against where you want your life to be. And, and this is step one. It gets, I don't know, easier or harder as we go through this. but. I'm going to show you how to be really specific and articulate when you're talking about what you want. This is the future of what you want, though. This just sets a framework for you to be able to make better decisions and measure opportunities and go, wow, here's the kinds of things I want my life to be like. And what happens is this allows you to start attracting more of the kinds of people and opportunities and circumstances you want. Right? So step one is begin with the end in mind. Is isolation important? I'm going to give you three simple examples. These are real life examples. First one's a friend of mine. And I was working with her, and we had a company uh, in Columbus, Ohio, and she was setting her goals, and I kept saying, you're not being specific. No, I am, I am. And her first goal was she wanted to be a millionaire by the end of the year. We are starting this about February, March, and I sent her off on her way, and she got a phone call late part of December. Her dad gave her an apartment building worth $1 million. <laughs> She's like, no, that isn't what I wanted. She wanted a million dollar business, not a million dollar apartment. 
So Universe gave her a million dollars because she wanted to be a millionaire, and she was. Here's another one, a friend of mine. I want to win an Oscar. I don't know, is this relevant thing, Betty? Does this with people want to win an Oscar? You want to win an Oscar? Okay. So does she. And I said, no, you don't. <clears throat> no, you really don't. She's like, no, I want to win an Oscar. And I'm like, you're not being specific. And so we sat down and I said, here's how you be specific. I said, here's why you don't want to win an Oscar. My guess is this girl was a friend of mine. She had helped co-found a very, very successful production company. Big budget films, $50, $100 million action, big film. I said, my guess is within two years, you're going to win an Oscar. And you're going to be standing on stage on a Saturday when nobody's on and the cameras aren't there winning an Oscar for best production and animation or best costume design on some of... She wanted an Oscar as an actor. She had moved over into acting. And her production company that she started won three Oscars two years later for a big budget film. So she actually won. Her company won three. She went on the stage for the first one. The next two, she's like, screw it. Because I don't know if you guys know, they give Oscars away before, not in the, mm -hmm. the prime time. There's a long list of them you can win. Here's the third one. This one's kind of interesting, I think. Somebody set a goal and said, I want a company worth a billion dollars. A guy I know started a company in 1996. He had learned how to set goals when he was about 24. And said, all right, if I set my goals far enough out, when I'm 33, I want a company worth a billion dollars. And I started a company in 1996. And in 1999, when I turned 33, our company was worth $980 million. I had a billion dollar company when I was 33. And I thought, this sucks, I asked for the wrong thing. The result was the company we built was worth X. But the amount of stock I owned was worth Y. I said, why is it worth so little? So again, I'm not money motivated, it's just it's how can we be specific. We had built this great company, but the amount that we owned, by the time it was there, was small. By the time we could sell it, the markets were crashing. There were a lot of things that were wrong. So just learn how to be specific. And when you think you're being specific, I want an Oscar, that's not specific enough. Now my new one, just for what's worth, I don't always share this, my, my, my <laughs> new one. I want a personal net worth of X. I want a company where I, the company thing's not relevant to me anymore. I had to go, oh crap, I screwed this one up. Let's start over. And so I'm still two years away, a couple years. Um, and one of our companies, actually I think it may get here, it may not. But, but the point is, I'm not going to relevant, be relevant on the money. That first slide I have that I did with you guys, I have a list of 15 things that I want. And my personal net worth one is really big because I have a long list of things I want to do for others. And I know what kind of people I want to be around and companies. So I have a checklist of things that we may get there, we may not, but I live my life going after the 15 things I want my life to be like. All right, so see yourself at the top of the mountain and stay there. That's kind of the point here, is how do you get here? Because this is where you want to live. That's kind of what I just said. I live right here at the top of the mountain. I've already achieved in my mind all the things I want. I just don't know when we're going to get there. All right, but every moment I live here because success doesn't look like this. This is what it really looks like. <laughs> all right, and it's kind of like climbing a mountain or hiking. Have you guys all been hiking or at least seen it? Would you agree that you don't walk straight up the mountain, you go around and twist, and sometimes it turns and goes... But if you know what's at the top of the mountain, you don't get to the turn and go, oh, and I deal with entertainment with people a lot, I love that. They're like, well, I thought positive, and I, was, I, I knew I was going to get this audition, and I didn't. I'm like, that's not the top of the mountain, that's just a turn. Oh, well, I went on this job interview, I thought I was going to get it, and I didn't. I'm like, that's just, it's a turn along the way. You've got to say, here's where I am, there's where I'm going. It's going to be messy to get there. Think what's in it for you, what's in it for me. This, this is where we start moving into some specific techniques. With it, with them, again, a lot of these are psychology that will help you along the way. What's in it for you says, what can I do to figure out what adds value to you? What's important to you? What kinds of things do you like or dislike? What would you change? How do I figure out what's important to you to add value? Let's figure out what's important in it for you and then we'll figure out what's in it for me and there's some specific ways to do that but this is a different way to think about things <clears throat> and it starts in not only your thinking it starts in your communication 
Uh, you guys don't have to read this. I don't like slides with a lot of text on them. That's why I send this out. But let me give you an example. A friend of mine, we were working on an entertainment company, and there was a guy that was president of a network who had left. And we knew he left, and we'd love to have him work in our company, and we're, you know, we had targeted him. I'll show you guys how to do that. And my friend wrote an email to him. He's, he always sends me his email because it took me about two years to retrain his mind on how to do this. He wrote this email and said, hello, Mr. So-and-so. I can't use his name. You guys would all know him. We have an amazing company. We have this great company, and here's my background, and I've won three Emmys, and here's what I've done, and I've done this and this, and I launched these companies, and I did this TV show, and I'd really love to meet with you. And the email was all about trying to impress this person in an email with all of his background and accolades. So it was all about him. I looked at it, I said, screw it, I rewrote it. And basically it was along these lines, it was about three sentences. Because I'd read the article about the person leaving and what was important to him was making a legacy for his family. He was concerned that the studio he left might have a, a, an interesting part of his reputation and he wanted to leave a legacy for his kids. So I wrote him a letter and said, you know, Mr. So-and-so, recently read an article about you. Seems like you're in a transition. We might have something that can help you accomplish your goals. I'd love to find a time to meet with you. Can we meet for coffee? Not only did we meet, <coughs> meet with them, the guys you know, ended up coming in, became an advisor. But what I did was I made the email alone all about him. Did I want him working for us selfishly? Absolutely. Did I want him involved? Absolutely. Was it about us? Absolutely not. I have something that can help you accomplish your goals. And we do that in, in almost all of our businesses. Our businesses are not about what we want. It's what does the client want or the customer, and how can we make our solution about accomplishing their goals. I was just in Chicago um, yesterday with Leo Burnett. I posted a picture with what I call my new best friend. I was sitting in the offices for the guys that do McDonald's and have my arm around Ronald McDonald. And the whole presentation was about a product we have. I'll show you guys in a minute. But it was about how our product could help McDonald's look better. It was about how it would help them accomplish their social goals, how it would look on their annual report. The whole presentation was how McDonald's could spin our product into what made them look good. And that was the premise of how we present almost everything. So learn how to add value by thinking about what's in it for others and even translating that into your language, your communication, even your emails. All right, so what do you do? How many people, like, what is it you do? Or what do you want to do? Um, I'm an aspiring a, a, a film editor, a, a hopefully narrative features. Okay. Anybody else want to? What else? What do you guys do? <coughs> it's okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Uh, writer, director, producer, but I also, I mean, I have a bunch of goals. Okay. So. <laughs> we're going to fix you by the time we're done? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Here's what happens. Most of the time when people talk about what they do, it's really confusing especially when you're in different industries. So the more I think about what you do, the more confused I get. Writer, editor, producer, director, film. It, I kept calling, we've got a, a, new, a new friend of ours, is um, a guy who won the Oscar for um, Hugo, the movie. I never even saw it. Anymore. And I kept calling him an animator. And finally, the guy that was with me is like, he won for special effects. I'm like, yeah, animation. They're like, no, special effects. Mm -hmm. They were specific. I mean, I'm, I'm on the outside. I'm like, I don't know. He won an Oscar for Hugo. It's a movie I didn't see. <laughs> but I yeah. thought animation and special effects were the same. So I'm going to tell you what it is we do, and I want you all to figure out how you can help me. We're an ASP and an SAS. We're a proprietary electronic platform redeploying assets across an enterprise using a functional or proprietary electronic currency. We're an ERP system in the fact that we sit above an Oracle or an SAP FA module. And we can do redeployments into a cost avoidance or procurement reduction program as an ERP initiative. But we don't do integration, we're just implementation across the change management program. All right, so can you guys help me? <laughs> Anybody that shakes their head, I'm always like, I want to talk to you. Because if you understood that gobbledygook ABC stuff, then you're in my industry. And you would go, wow, that's freaking cool. And everybody else is like, huh? <laughs> That's what happens when you guys walk out. When you start explaining what you do, you're in a, a world where your terminology you understand. Other people don't. So here's what happens when you talk to people. Most people are lost. 
they're confused, they're not sure what you're doing, I'm going to show you how this is what really happens. When you talk to people, you think you are a rock star. All right, guess which song I'm playing. You know what I guess? Happy birthday. That's, you always get that guess. All right, so here's what's going on. In my head, right, and I don't sing, so bear with me. It's, oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light. Here's the point. In my head, I hear that song perfectly. And all you guys hear is this. That's what happens when you talk to people. They don't hear what you hear in your head, and you hear it perfectly. So what we need to do is figure out how to move around that. And we've got to figure out how to get people to understand what you're doing and how to help. So what are these people doing? Anybody want to guess what are they doing? Climbing a mountain. Climbing a mountain. This is how you reframe what you think. We're thought, hey, these people are climbing a mountain. Climbing a mountain is hard. They're not climbing a mountain. What they're actually doing is rappelling down it. <laughs> it's easier to get down a mountain than it is to get up. So we're going to figure out how do you get down the mountain and how do you isolate what you want. And this is it. This is kind of the crux, the middle of the presentation. It starts uh, you know, speeding up after that. The number one thing we teach within here is something called a tornado technique. And this is what I want you guys to spend a lot of time thinking through because this is the basis for everything you want to do in conversation. All right, how many people have seen a tornado? In person. In person. No, but, the movie what? Wow, where are you from? Virginia. Okay, Virginia, <laughs> the South. All right, this is one of my few trick questions. I don't have that many. What is the most powerful part of a tornado? Oh, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> See, some people guess the eye. There is no eye in a tornado. And the eye of the hurricane is actually the calmest part, so they're wrong twice. That's why it's a trick question. A tornado is an interesting phenomenon. When it's spinning around up in the air, there's no, there's no damage. There's no power. All of the damage of the tornado is that little tiny tip that touches the ground. If that tornado does not touch the ground, there is no destruction. All the car in the refrigerator, all the crap flying around at the top of the tornado is not relevant to the tip that touches the ground. That's what you've got to learn how to be. How can you be destructive and specific in what you do? Here's the way the tornado technique works. Number one, realize most people don't understand what you do or don't care. And it's not bad. It's just the psychology is they don't get it or they don't care. You've got to move them around that. So number one, there is an emotional value of what do you do. What do you do? Something emotional there. Why do we want it to be emotional? People make decisions emotionally and defend them logically. Right? In movies, in film, in television, news, it's about emotion. How do you drive that emotion? So there's an emotional value of what you do. Underneath that emotion, there's certain industries that you go into. Within those industries, there are certain specific companies. Within those companies, there are specific titles. And within there, there should be three to five people that you want to meet right now. Now, if you look at this and said, I'm looking for a job, well, what do you do? There's something emotional about what you do. It has nothing to do with the technical side. Well, where do you want to work? I want to work in these industries. Well, in those industries, where do you want to work? Well, my wish list are these three companies. Well, who do you want to talk to? Well, within those companies, it's this title. It's production manager. It's HR. It's head of marketing. Well, who are the people you want to meet right now? I'd love to meet these five people. I'm going to show you how this works. Really simple on a couple examples. So you guys just heard me do gobbledygook with Ronastar. Watch how easy this works. Clear your mind for a minute. If I tell you what I do, I want you to listen and watch what happens in your mind if pictures start forming and we come up to a conclusion of how you can help me. Here's what Ronastar is. We help really big companies save a lot of money. We're in industries like automotive, manufacturing, government, public schools, healthcare, really big industries with lots of stuff sitting around. In those industries, we're dealing with Halliburton, United Airlines, NASA, Chicago Public Schools. Within those big companies, we sell primarily to the CFO. If you know any CFO save money, I'd love to talk to them. And right now, we're trying to meet the CFO for the state of California, Los Angeles Public Schools, and any of the big studios like Disney. Now, I've timed that before. That's probably less than 30 seconds. 
What do I do? This is watch the two questions I'm going to ask you guys. See if this is effective. Number one, what do we do at Ronastar? We help companies save money. Save, save money. And who am I trying to meet? CFOs. CFOs. That's all you need. Everything else is so irrelevant of what people are going to remember about what you do. So we get so caught up into knocking and telling our story, you need them to remember something emotional and important and who you're trying to meet. If I'm looking for a job and I'm leaving, you know, and I'm doing marketing, somebody says, oh, well, you just graduated. What do you do? I'm looking for a job. I'm not looking for a job. What I'm doing is I just graduated with a degree in international marketing, and I'm trying to change the way companies do business with countries like China and India. So I'm trying to change the way companies do business. I really want to work in, in financial services or manufacturing. I'd love to work at these three companies, Citicorp, Carlisle Group, or Cantor Fitzgerald. If you know the HR director in any of those companies, I'd love to meet them. And my wish list is I want to meet Jamie Dimon. I'd love to meet George Soros. People are going to remember, hey, he's trying to do business in China, but here's who he wants to meet. If I'm looking for a job, I'm going after the people I want to meet, not who might need me as a job. So this translates into anything. One of the other companies we have, this is kind of what, what Norm was talking about. So for what we do, uh, I actually run an incubator. Somebody was asking me walking up, how'd you get your start? I'm unhirable. I learned that early on. So I did retail stores in college. I wrote three books when I was 20. How to improve your credit, how to apply for credit, how to budget and finance your money. Had an infomercial at age 21, fourth ever infomercial on television. Always kind of like ahead of the curve. Did six years sales training, financial services. I would hire and train people to go sell life insurance at night on full commission to their friends. How many of you would sign up for that deal? Yeah. Give me five minutes with you. Completely change your mind. <laughs> because what I would do is I would find out what are your goals? How do you want to get there? And I would build a story around the emotional value of how what's important to you gets you where you want to go. All of these companies are about setting up stories. So one of them we're doing, this was the one we were in Chicago for, called My Wet Rock. This one's a little wordy, but again, here's what we do. We have a simple device that saves water, plastic, and power. It saves money for consumers, and it provides education. So families around the country are trying to save money and help the environment. We have something that does that. We're going after really big industry companies, though, hotels, retail, manufacturing. We're primarily focused on companies like Starbucks, McDonald's, Shell, any company with 50 to 100,000 or more employees are who we've targeted. Within those companies, we're going after what's called a CSR, Social Responsibility Director. So if you know any CSRs or social people within these large companies, that's who you want to talk to. And our wish list, and I always like doing this, is directly we'd like to meet Mike Duke, Vinod Kosla, Jeff Skoll, Michael Eisner, people like that. Wet Rock, what do we do? We help save money. water, money, plastic. It doesn't matter. I put three or four adjectives out there. We're going after big companies, and here's who we want to meet. What is the product? How's it work? All of that's not as relevant when you're talking to people. This is what I like to do. How many people know what Mike or who Mike Duke is? This is, this is where when you start getting specific, where the slasher that you were, writer, actor, producer, director, which is what LA is, the next technique's gonna show you how to change that. But if you don't know who Mike Duke is, that's okay. Somebody else does. So I'm not saying, oh, I just wanna meet anybody. Oh, I wanna meet any director, any producer, no. Mike Duke was chairman of Walmart. How many know Vino Kosla? It's okay, four people do, I've already met him twice. Jeff Skull? You spelled his name wrong. It's I know. Skull. Thank you. <laughs> the people that know him, Skull, Jeff did uh, Participant Productions. Yeah. Big, big company. Michael Eisner. I've never met Michael, but I've met all the guys that run Tornate, his investment group, which is more important for us. So this allows us to, to kind of position what it is we're doing. Another one, Orion Nation, it's an anti-Facebook platform. The minute you say anti-Facebook, it creates an emotional response. Well, what do you mean? We've got an anti-TMZ platform. Think of the difference between Jerry Springer and Oprah. Springer's gossip, Oprah's authentic. There's a lot of companies out there that do Jerry Springer gossip. TMZ, OMG, Wonderwall, Perez. Nobody has a destination site that's 100% authentic content for celebrities. There's not an Oprah type platform. So what I've just done is emotionally separated what we're doing. 
how, what, all the things underneath doesn't matter. We provide celebrities a platform to control their message. We deal with companies like CAA, Endeavors, Roger Cowan, PMK. We're looking for managers and publicists. And again, we'd like to thank you. Don't no look. Just go <laughs> Ryan Seacrest, Scooter Braun, Ashton, Jeff Zucker, Ron Barkle. These are a little old. Everybody on here I've met in person except for Jeff. We have a meeting with Ryan. Scooter manages Justin Bieber. Ashton's working. Ashton's actually working with Ron Burkle now at Ukaipa. And Zucker, we've got a meeting coming up. He just took another job. So my point of this isn't to impress you guys. It's to impress upon you. I'm not saying, oh, we're doing entertainment. We need, you know, we need people in entertainment. No, we're looking at these agencies, these managers, these publicists. These are the names. If you're trying to get into CAA, I have people do that a lot. Oh, I want to be in CAA. I'm like, well, where? I want to be represented. By who? There's hundreds of agents that do specific things. Some are television, some are music. You know, how do you isolate who you want to meet? If you want to work with producers, directors, this technique just says emotional, industry, title, name. If you're looking for a job, do the same thing. If you're looking for financing, do the same thing. If you're trying to work with people, it's just a sequence to be able to isolate down and get very specific in who you're trying to meet. All right, so if you and I met, what's your name? Albert. Alberto? Yes. If Alberto and I met, and he and this isn't picking on you, it's the, the slasher side, writer, producer, actor. I, I do all these things, so hopefully you pick one that's of interest and we can talk about it. You know, that's what happens is we're, we're saying, here's all the things we do, let's find a common point of interest. What I do with people is I reverse the tornado technique. So I'll, I'll ask somebody, I'm like, all right, what do you do? Well, what's the number one thing you want to do? You know, if you have a company, what's your value to your customer? If you say, oh, I'm an editor, right? Well, what's the value you bring to the people that you work with? What's your best skill set? What kind of companies are you working with currently? What kind of titles? I can ask people in reverse the questions to sequence down because I don't understand their business and I don't have time to try and understand it. But if I can figure out the emotional value of what you do and who you're trying to meet, I can get you there. And it's kind of, I'll, I'll go back to, to the story with, with Rodrigo, the guy who won the Oscar. He's giving me all of this illustration. I, I, don't, I don't get what he does. He finally showed me a video of Porsche, of this car driving down the road and the thing just peels apart. And it just disintegrates. And it, as it disintegrates, you're seeing into the engine and into the wheels. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. That's visual effects. But at the end, I go, okay, Rodrigo. What companies are you trying to work with? Oh, well, here's the, and you start naming the companies. All of a sudden I'm going, right, now I know some companies I can help you. Who do you sell to in those companies? Oh, well, we're in through the marketing. I'm like, all right. So by the time we were done, we had a wish list of six companies that he wants to work with and who he's trying to get to. And I happen to know people in three of the six companies. So all I did was I reversed this to get to where he was trying to get to without him understanding on his own. So you can reverse this and have a very simple conversation with somebody. And this is the whip and whip them side. Is how do I figure out what's in it for you? And what that leads to is the fourth one, which, Alberto, which is what you're never going to do again, is you're never going to tell somebody what you do first. You're going to deflect, defer, and disclose. When people ask me what I do, I, I almost never answer directly. But you can't do it this way, all right? We're, we're going to role play. This one's easy. What's your name? Eddie. Eddie. So if Eddie and I met, this is like a networking technique if you guys are out or talking to people. And Eddie and I are at an event and Eddie's got his name tag on and I've got mine that says Steve and me, Big Bamboo. Or Rona Star or, or Cineplex, it doesn't matter. And Eddie and I meet and Eddie asks me, what do you do? So ask me. What do you do? Well, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work. Right? That's called combat. The mind flares up. All of a sudden you're like, well, hey, I asked you a question, asshole. <laughs> You have to play mental ping pong. So if Eddie asked me again, ask me again, what do you do? What do you do? Um, you know what, Eddie, we run an incubator, we kind of create companies. But anyway, tell me more about your company. That looks interesting. Deflect, defer, and disclose says somebody asks you a question, answer it without really answering, and then redirect the question back to them. What do you do? Oh, I'm an editor and do some work in entertainment. But hey, tell me more about you. People love to talk about themselves. When you can redirect the conversation back to that person and get them talking, you are back in control. The person doing all the talking isn't the one in control. The person asking the questions is the one in control. 
You want to learn to control those questions and conversations. But what you don't want them to do is ramble on and knock to the wind telling you what they do when you're not going to understand it or it doesn't matter or it's not relevant. Or even if you know what they do, that what they do has nothing to do with what they need to be helped with. So you sequence them, sequence them back through the tornado technique of saying, all right, hey, that's kind of cool. So, hey, who do you sell to? What industry are you? Who are you trying to meet? Give me your wish list of your top three to five people you want to meet right now. And I'm not going to ask you guys to raise hands, but I've done that before. When I'm talking to people, I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of get it. Who's your wish list? Like, what do you mean? Give me your wish list right now, the three to five people you want to meet right now that if they could sit in this room would change your business. How many of you guys know the three to five people by name you want to meet right now? Okay, one, one or two. It's all right. It's not bad. Again, this is, this is to get you to think, how do I know who those people are? To not know, let's go back here, to not know who the people are that would help you in your business, in your career, is, is a travesty to not learn early. If you learn it early and you have that wish list, the likelihood of you getting introduced to those people increases dramatically. All right, see how this stuff's starting to sequence? If we in stack, if we go all the way back to Alice, like where do you want to go? I don't know, then anything will get you there. Where do you want to go? I want to go here and I want to meet those four people. Oh, that's a road we can get you on. So whatever your business is, figure it out. And for us, we have that same sequence for the people we want for funding, the people we want for partners, the people we want for management. So we've gone through that example, and if I'm talking to somebody, this is why you deflect, defer, and disclose, by the way, and not be a slasher. I'm not picking on you. I'm hoping this helps. Is If you reverse the tornado technique, if Eddie and I are talking, and Eddie, I figure out, is in entertainment, we're going to sit and talk, and I'm going to ask Eddie these things, and by the time we're done, I'm going to know a little bit more about Eddie and what he does. Deflect, defer, and disclose lets me do that. And then you get to this one. This is the fun one. This is my psychological warfare in the middle. This is my jujitsu. What I'm going to do is, if Eddie and I are talking, I'm going to make mental notes as I'm going through the sequence. What he needs, who, and if I get to two or three names in my head, if I get to four or five, my mental peg runs out and I start writing them down. But what I'm going to do when I'm talking to Eddie is, if he and I are talking and, and somebody pops in mind I think he should meet, I'm not going to go do the following. Eddie, do you know so-and-so? Oh my God, you need to meet this guy. You guys ever done that in conversation? Right? Either we do it out of habit or somebody else says it. You're talking, they're like, oh, do you know so Right? No. And then you're off down the path of talking about so-and-so. What you want to do when you're having the conversations with other people is make mental notes of introductions that you think you can make to help them. Two, three, four names, two, three, four companies. You want to make mental notes. So when Eddie and I are done talking, and done means I'm done asking him questions because I've asked him four or five or six or eight things to figure out how I can help him. Here's what I'm going to do to Eddie. I'm going to say, Eddie, wow, that was great. Um, here's two or three people that come to mind I think might help you based on what we just talked about. Here's so-and-so. Here's where he works. Here's another guy. Here's, here's a girl I know that does this in this industry. And if I've listened and if I happen to know people, I'm going to give Eddie two or three or four names. And then I'm going to say, remind me when we're done to tell you how to get a hold of them. Now let me tell you what I do. And I've just done two things. One, I've isolated what Eddie does, does to make my conversation with him infinitely more relevant. If you're a writer, producer, director, the conversation you have as a writer with one person's different than you would have with somebody else. If they're, you know, if you're in, in music, does that make sense? If you know more about the other person, it's not that you can't do all these things, but in a conversation, the more targeted you are to the person you're talking to, the more relevant it becomes. How do you become relevant? You ask questions of the other person where you are in control by asking the questions. And what the second thing is you've done is you've built a psychological referral burden on poor little Eddie. <laughs> because I've just told him I'm going to give him two or three names and now when I tell him what I do he's paying attention and I'm going to get his best guys the reason I'm able to get introductions to the names that I put on the board isn't that I'm special or people like I build a psychological burden on somebody where I'm willing to help them and give them names 
that psychological reciprocation makes them feel like they need to give me names back. And if they have them, they will. And if they don't, it's okay. They know what I do and what I need. So this, build referral currency, this is how you start getting referrals in this industry. This is how you start getting people to help you. This is how you start getting people to send you people and give you names and, and help you along your career by figuring out how to help others and connect those dots. And it's simple, emotional value, names. It's the way our mind works, works on pictures. So build referral currency is how do you create this implied referral or, or burden. Then it moves into this, learn how to call a referral. And this one gets really simple. Here's how you don't call a referral. If I've been referred to somebody, what's your name? Brian. Here's the way you don't call Brian. And you guys have probably been through this. Ring, ring, Brian's gonna answer. Hello. Hello. Hey Brian, this is Steve and me. Listen, I'm, I'm graduated from USC Film School and I've got this and here's what I'm doing. And Have you guys ever had a phone call, right? And you pick it up and you don't recognize the caller ID and you debate, should I answer it? You answer it and then somebody just starts right in on you. And you're like, wait, who is it? Why did I answer? And you're looking at the phone. <laughs> Don't be that person. The way you call a referral is very specific, very easy. Hey, Brian, this is Steve and me. Hello, Steve. No pause. See what I just did? I paused. Hey, this is Steve and me. Here's what Brian's doing. Okay, hi, Steven. But in his mind, he's like, who are you? Why are you calling? Do I know you? You know me. You're giving him time to think and sequence through who you are, why you called. Don't do it. Hey Brian, my name is Stephen Mead. I was given your name and number by Norm at USC. Again, no pause. Because if I stop there, he's like, okay, yeah, I know Norm, but who, what, why? So it's these three things in sequence. Hey Brian, my name is Stephen Mead. I was given your name by Norm at, at USC. Did I catch you at a good time? That's five seconds. Name, he doesn't know me. Norm, established credibility. Did I catch you at a good time? Shows courtesy for him to say yes or no. Yeah, actually you did. Okay, great. Here's why I'm calling. I and then you move into why you're calling that person. I've got a company, here's what we do, here's what we're trying to move. I read something about you, Norm thought we could help you accomplish your goal, I'd love to talk. No? Okay, great, is there a better time to call? What, what happens here is if you do this referral technique, the isolation, you'll end up getting referrals to people. Right? Who, who has a wish list? Like, who, who's one of the top people you'd love to meet? Brian, anybody in the industry? No? Alright. Anybody? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Adam McKay. Okay, who is he? Uh, he oh, one of the directors of Funny or Die, the uh, comedy website. Oh, ah, cool. He directed Anger Man. Okay. He Anger Man. Ah, see, now this is what's interesting is the tornado technique would have worked. You went straight to the name, mm -hmm. and I'm like, who is he? When you said Funny or Die, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, well, I know those guys. I know the CAA guys. I know so I couldn't connect the dot on the name, I connected the dot on the Funny or Die. If I knew Funny or Die was created by CAA where we started, I know 15 people at CAA. See how the mind works? It's, you gave me a name, we start at the bottom, because I asked you. But if you had said, oh, well CAA created something called Funny or Die, and this guy did the direct, you just gave me three isolated visuals for me to say, do I know about CAA, do I know about Funny or Die, and do I know this individual? Just, it's just the way our mind works, right? So if I said, oh, I, I actually know Adam, or I don't know Adam, but I know the guys that created it at CAA, yeah, here's their number. You can call them, but when you call them, call them like this, right? So learning how to call a referral works because you'll end up getting names. So this one's there. Learn how to make an introduction. Now this one's really cool because if you understand tornado technique and you understand what you're doing and you also start moving into networking, this, you guys may not be in a class or industry where you do a lot of business networking and things like that. We actually do. It's a lot of business development. Learning how to make an introduction is great. If Eddie and I met, and what's her name? Hi, Dan. All right, so if Eddie and I, I met, I don't know Eddie, but I, I sequence to it. I know, oh, Eddie's kind of needing this, and he's a visual effects producer, and he's looking to work on a new movie. And then I meet Dan, and I talk to Dan, and I find out Dan's got a new movie, and it's in animation, he's looking for visual. I can make an introduction by not saying, oh, Eddie, hey, you should meet Dan here, you guys talk. <laughs> People ever done that to you? Oh, you guys should know each other, talk. You're like, okay, great. No, learn how to make an introduction that says, hey, 
here's Eddie, and here's what he does, and here's what he's looking for, and here's Dan, and here's what Dan does, and here's what he was looking for, I thought you guys should talk. 10, 15, 20 seconds. Not only do you make an introduction, you're now establishing value. Those two guys owe you because you made an introduction on what's in it for them. If they know what you do, they're going to try and help you. So you start building that aspect of momentum where people help you. If you do this in a networking event, it's kind of fascinating because you meet people, you ask good questions, very sequential. You're not stuck talking to them 20 minutes. You're like, oh, here, Eddie, meet Dan, and here's it. These guys will end up bringing people to you at an event that you need to meet because you just help them. So rather than bouncing around and reading name tags, you can strategically figure out how to make introductions. And then this one I want to stress. There is a difference between refer and recommend. Right? I know some amazing people, and we're fortunate in, in the people we've got to meet. I will refer people to them without hesitation. If I know what they're looking for, you know, I know what their goals are, I can refer somebody. Eddie and I could have just met, and if I know, I'm making it up, Eddie, I don't know what you do. So I, he's, a, he's a great you know, editor, and he does these things, and I know somebody's looking for an editor, I'll refer him, but I'll refer him cautiously. Saying, hey, I just met Eddie, he was in a class at school, I don't really know him, but seems like he's doing something you're looking for, I'd love for you guys to meet. A recommendation is, I've known Norm for six years, I've worked with him, I'd love for you guys to meet because I know him really well. And the reason this is important is, sometimes you'll talk to people and they go, oh, well, you know, I, I don't know you that well, or oh, you can't make that introduction. Just psycho psychologically separate. There's a difference between refer and recommend, but the referral is you may not know that person that well. Just protect that introduction by stating, hey, I just met this person, but I think they can help you. Right? Refer and recommend is a big difference. No matter what you guys do, whether it's looking for a job, whether it's looking for partners, looking for employees, you're going to be in a position where if you understand how the psychology works of attraction and communication, this stuff gets easier. This one's a fun one. Take meetings early and often. All right, so what, what is it you do? I'm a director of short form comedy. Okay, perfect. That's why you want to meet the Funny or Die guys. Okay. If you had a chance to meet Adam, what, Adam was his name, yeah, right? Yeah, McKay. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're ready to meet him? Probably not. <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, well, one, because I'm kind of stringing this together right now, but also uh, um, I'd want more material to show him. I mean, I, I don't even know what I'd be asking him for. Bingo. That's why it's not going to work for you. So I want you to think differently. Because the reality is you don't know what you need. You don't know how far. You don't know when you're ready. But you know you're not ready. So my premise is take meetings early and often. If, if I were you, and again, none of this, guys, is me putting you down or doing it. It's just it's how to think differently. If I'm in your position and I was referred to Adam, I'd go in and I would take a meeting early and often by going in asking for help. I'd be able to get in saying, hey Adam, Norm referred me to you, I'm just coming out of school, I love your work, I, I, these three things you've done I thought are brilliant, could we meet? And I'd love for you to just tell me what kind of things I need to work on. To give me some inside direction of what I need to maybe one day be at your level, to maybe one day be represented at CAA by an agent like you. you know, take meetings early and often under the premise of not overselling yourself because you're ready go in humbly saying, hey, I know I'm not ready, I'm looking for help. I'd love your insight. You know, we're a big proponent of this. The number one question I ask, I don't even know if it's on here. Oh, yeah, it's, it's here. I don't ask it that way. Anytime we start a new company, we're getting access to really amazing people. I go into the meetings asking one primary question. Like, here's this great new company we're doing. Tell me why it won't work. What am I missing? We go in soliciting negative feedback. We go in saying, Here's what we think, think about doing. Why won't this work? What am I missing? What could we do differently? You know, for us to do business with a company like yours, what are the three or four things we need to do to one day be able you know, to work with you? So Adam, what are the things you would think are important for me to work on? I'd love to learn that. So you're going in, not that, oh, I'm not ready. You're going in, building a relationship with somebody under the premise of you have a direct introduction and you're asking for help. You're asking what you need. You're asking to have an ongoing relationship to hopefully one day be able to do something. Let's say you had your meeting with Adam. Went great, you had your coffee. Well, one question is almost never asked. What can I do for you? Exactly. 
So not only is that question almost never asked because we're like, oh, well, geez, what could I possibly do for this guy? That's the absolute wrong way to ask. It's not specific. It's not isolated. If, if you have met with Adam and you said, oh, my gosh, Adam, this was great. What can I do to help you? Oh, don't worry about it. Nothing. <laughs> Pat you on the head. Thanks, kid. Move along. Too broad. But what you want to do when you ask somebody, what you want to ask them, especially if they're in a position of power, is not what can I do to help you. It's what are the top X that you're working on? And X is a number. If Eddie and I met and he was, you know, some amazing person, position of power like he is, I'd say, Eddie, this was great. I really appreciate your time. By the way, what are the top two or three things you're working on now that you're most passionate about? What two or three things that I can keep in mind and if I run across somebody I can help you, I'd love to send them to you. What one or two things is, are your biggest problem? Yeah, Rebecca. Right now I'm try finishing uh, my first feature. And that would be the main one, straight up. Um, other than that, I'm writing a screenplay for a feature-length fantasy movie. Yeah. That I want to get produced. In okay. Well, like I said, we'll talk because produced it doesn't mean anything to Maybe. me. Produced by somebody, uh, and here's who you want to work. I wanted. I would like it to get produced by a studio like Paramount or Universal Fox. Okay. And who in? I mean, I know all kinds of. I don't know who in there. But we can do this I later. Don't, I don't know the particular people. Okay. As then, far as the other feature, I'd need you know someone in like Screen Gems or something like that too. Right. So this is where this is is interesting. Is what you just said, is where there's a distinction between you being the ninety percent, ninety five, ninety nine, and the one percent that says I'm going to take it to the next step and I'm going to go do some research in Paramount to see who's funding these kind of films, who's the production manager. I'm going to look at digital Hollywood and see who's on the panel. I'm going to read Variety, and I'm going to come up with three or four or five names of people I want to meet, and I'm going to take that on my, I'm going to be proactive in finding those people, not reactive, in hoping I get an introduction. Mm -hmm. right? But my point I was trying to make here is, is if you meet somebody in a position of power, just be a little more specific. What are the top two or three things you're working on that I might be able to help with? What are your one or two biggest issues? What you're trying to do is you're trying to isolate to one or two things and you're trying to open that door of ongoing communication. So my point back to is if you met Adam and you said, what can I do to help? He's like, oh, nothing, pat head, go. You said, hey, what are the top you know, one or two projects you're working on right now that you have issues with that if I run across them, I'd love to be able to send them to you. What are the things you're working on that I can keep in mind and maybe help you one day? You, you first have distinguished yourself by asking. Second, you've distinguished yourself by isolating. And third, you've left the door open of communication to go back to Adam and add value to him for something that's a problem that he needs fixed. So whether you're ready or not becomes irrelevant now to a relationship that you can add value to somebody that could become important later on. So, yeah, Bill. Um, well, or Brian, sorry. On, on that, though, like, if you're meeting someone in a high power position, I feel like it's, it's weird. You're like, what are you working on? How can I help? I mean, I don't know. It's, I feel like in, in our industry, it's, it'd be... I, I and like, and I, I like and appreciate that question. And where you're going with it, and, and not to, to intercede with it, is uh, sometimes our own psychology, again, we're on the, the isolation in a dark room. Oh, my God. What could I possibly do to help this guy? He's, he's here and I'm here. Mm -hmm. Follow me what I did. You separated yourself by asking. You separated yourself by isolating. You open the door. Even if you can't help, just the fact that you did is a separation from other people. The fact that you now know what he wants or needs is a door that could be opened at a future point. But I'm going to tell you a quick little story, and I use this one all the time because it might surprise you, and I think I can get through it. It's a little tough. Let's see if it's on here. Ask great questions. Why won't this work? Deflect, defer, and disclose. I'll, I'll come back. We're finishing up. Home stretch. A friend of mine was chief of staff of NASA for four presidential administrations. I'll tell this story all the time. He, all the secrets between the president and all the weird crap going on in space went through my friend. So we had some really cool conversations. Did they fake the moon landing? The what? Did they fake the moon landing? Didn't fake the moon landing, and we'll put it on tape. They're going to have to announce that there's pyramids on Mars probably within 18 months because the telescopes are finally getting strong enough you'll be able to see. That's why they've been announcing water throughout the universe. Watch all the, watch all the news stories that are coming out. There's water on the moon. There's water here. Oh, they just found life in Antarctica in a glacier. 
lake 250 miles underground or 200 there, there's there's things that we think will get announced this is on tape conspiracy theory side but whether it happens or not, I don't know it's a cool conversation but here's my point <laughs> here was my point when I was meeting with this person and we we had a couple of good conversations and and I asked him that I'm like God yeah Courtney, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for your help. I mean, we're always very, very effusive. And, and I said, just out of curiosity, and I, and I knew him well enough in our conversation and stuff, I said, outside of government, I'm just curious. Like, what are you most passionate about? What are you, what are you working on that maybe I can help you with? So I moved it out of government to something passionate, and I asked him. And here's what he told me. He goes, well, he goes, gosh, that's an interesting question. He goes, actually, I do have something. Maybe you could help me, because he's in D.C. I'm in L.A., he goes, for five years I've been putting together this pro project. And in the, the Holocaust, and if I butcher this because I don't get all the terminology right, I'm, I'm sorry, but it was during the, the Holocaust, there was uh, the, the Jewish concentration camps, there was this little religious artifact called a Torah. And the Torah was something that you know was snuck in and, and you used it to study. And if you got caught with it, they knew they were going to be killed anyway, but if they were caught with this, it would be devastating. And... It was snuck in and concentrated, and they would huddle around. And then, um, at the end of the war, it was smuggled back out. And it's a very famous, you know, important artifact. And we knew that it was important, so one day we gave it to the first Israeli astronaut ever going into space to get the document as close to God as possible. And that astronaut and that Torah were on the Challenger that blew up. He goes, and I've got this passion. We're doing a project called the Tiny Torah. We're trying to do a documentary and, you know, don't really know a lot of people in L.A. And I'm going, okay, well, what are you trying to do? He goes, oh, well, we need this. And, and he gave me a list. I'm like, oh, well, we know the guys that did Mel Gibson's thing over here that was the, the crisis. And all of a sudden, had nothing to do with government. Here's one of the most powerful guys in D.C. that wanted something entertainment related that I could actually help him with. And that documentary, actually, it's on my blog somewhere. It's actually done now. It just came out. And they changed the name, but it's about this artifact. And so my point is, you never know until you ask. And what somebody's working on or needs, you may be able to add value. And if you can, great. If you can't, it's okay. You've at least asked in a unique way that most other people don't. And you now have an open door. If you knew what the person wanted, and you could add value to it, it could be three, six, nine months, a year later but you know what that person needs, you've got an open door. So don't be afraid to ask. It's just like when I said earlier, when I had those names at the bottom, I said, do you guys know Mike Duke? You're like, no. I'm like, okay, it's all right. Do you know this person? No, it's okay. Somebody else will. I don't take it personally if you don't know. If I can't help you, I tell you I can't help you, but I at least know what you do to possibly be able to do it in the future. All right? So ask great questions is, is kind of what we went through. What does it take to make this happen? I'm trying to do... A movie, you know, Adam, and, and what, what would it take to make this happen? What would it take to one day work with you? What did you guys have to do to get represented by CAA? Who did you bring in outside of Adam and the, the team, you know, that put this deal together? How can I struck? Like, ask good questions. Ask good questions. Deflect, defer, and disclose. Learn about the other person first. Types of questions. What are the top two or three things you're working on? What are you most passionate about? What things are causing you the most problem? no right or wrong way to ask. The fact that you ask, ask it specific. It could be about problem, it could be about passion. I like those two things, right? Emotion, logic, people do more to avoid pain than gain pleasure. What are you most passionate about is a great question. What's your biggest problem you're trying to solve? What are the two or three things? Build a good advisory board. Any of you guys that are actually gonna start, this is more entrepreneurial, but whether it's entrepreneurial, or whether you're trying to be a director, how can you create an advisory board? If you had a chance to meet with Adam early, here's what I'm trying to do. If it goes well, you know what he wants. If you could get him on an advisory board just to have an open communication as you're moving, that might be helpful. If you learn how to get access to these guys early on and add value to them, you can build an advisory board and figure out what's going on where they can help you. Create value for others. Figure out how you can help them. Ask for help indirectly. Types of advisors. When you're building a company, we have different types of advisors. Strategic, marketing, human, knowledge, capital, experimental. And don't be afraid to change your advisors or your premise of how you set your company up. Right? I'm going to give you 
Um, one example, we have a company that uh, has just launched four or five months ago, has a chance to be bigger than Google. How many, how many people think you can build a company bigger than Google? I don't know if we will either. <laughs> but by default, Google converts a certain number of ads a month, right? Where somebody goes to the internet and they click on a little ad, and that's how Google makes money. And I'm not belittling Google, it's just that's their business. If you, if you simplify Google down, click on an ad, they make money. Does everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. Well, we created a company where when you hit send on your mobile device, your phone, you guys can all call me the devil incarnate when we're done. The four seconds between when the phone rings and when it connects is called a sequencing gap, silence. You guys ever notice? Wait, wait, wait. We build a technology to put a four second audio message in the gap of a phone call. Thank you for being a valued AT&T customer. Phone connects. Your phones do a software upgrade. Press one for details. Hey, this is Justin Bieber. Want a free ringtone from Disney? Press one. <laughs> And it's a direct response, actual audio, 35 billion calls a day worldwide. It's 500 million hours of inventory. It's a larger market than Google. Will we ever get there? I don't know. Again, on my list of 12, 15 things I want, it fits in there. If it gets there, great. If not, I'm having a lot of fun climbing the mountain. But my point, as it relates to this, is when I came up with that idea, which was almost six and a half years ago, I first thought we were going to have to build the company being a switch. I don't know what a switch is any more than I know what a, a, I can't even think of the name, Avid machines are. I've heard of Avids and I thought they were insects. And I'm like, oh, we were on an Avid, we're now we're on this. I'm like, what? Is that an insect? Yeah, some editors think that too. Yeah, you know, so you're on an Avid and an Apple. I'm, I'm confused. When we started out, we thought we were a switch company. Then we thought we were a software company. Then we thought we were an advertising company. Then we thought we were a messaging company. And then at the end, when we actually launched, getting back to asking the other person, what well, we realized our customer with that company is a cell phone company. And you would think cell phone companies would like to make money. Would you guys agree? Sure. All right. So here's my point with this one. This will show you why it's important to ask questions. We had a business model. Now, my original business model for this idea was when you hit send on your phone and you're calling somebody else what's called a mobile-to-mobile -mobile call. It's a free call, right? Verizon to Verizon's free. It doesn't count against your minutes. You guys all aware of that? When you make a call, how many of you know if that call's in the network and it's free? How do you know? No idea. That to me is stupid. Most of the companies we create around our, our ideas, I think, well, this is stupid. Let's fix it. So the original idea was just play a message in mobile-to-mobile -mobile calls. Hey, this call notification is sponsored by Diet Coke. Pretty simple. Never been done. Took us years to figure out how to do it. But our model was, I, I took this into Verizon and said, hey, and I had a guy that, that was our advisor. I said, we've got a great meeting coming up with, a, with Verizon. Here's my numbers. Here's what we're doing. Gary, tell me why this won't work. And here was my proposal. Verizon had, I think the numbers, if I remember this was years ago, about 400 million calls a day. If you charged advertising, what's called a CPM, $3, meaning you get $3 per thousand. 400 calls a day times a $3 CPM times the number of calls for the year split with Verizon. Well, let's see, that's $1.5 billion. We'd split it with Verizon, that's $750 million in potential revenue. That was my pitch going in. How many of you think Verizon would say yes? Gary said, kid, let me tell you something. I love my call kid, because now I'm getting older, and so I still deal with older guys who call me kid. He said, let me tell you how we work at Verizon. Here's why what you're doing won't work. Again, this is the relevance of asking why it won't work. I had a proposal for $1.5 billion in revenue. Split with them. Why not? He goes, did you do a focus group? Right? I said, of course. He goes, what were your numbers? Well, 95% of the people liked it. If it was just short, 5% don't. He goes, all right, here's the way we think. He goes, at Verizon, at the time when I was there, he had just left. He goes, we had 80 million subscribers, right? People pay their bill. 95% of the people like what you're doing. He goes, I care about the 5% that don't. 5% of 80 million is 4 million people that are going to dial 611 on their phone thinking it's a free call. They're going to call my call center. It cost me $15 a call. 
So your four million people that don't like you cost me $60 million to think about you. Half of those people are going to get pissed off. Their dog ate their homework. They have a message. Two million people are going to leave just because they're mad. Two million people at 50 a month, it's a $100 million a month problem. For the year, he goes, you are a billion dollar problem sitting in front of me. Do you think we care about advertising? Now, we learned that lesson four years ago. All these people running around saying, oh, we're going to do mobile advertising. No, oh, uh -uh. this is why you still don't see a lot of it to this day, because the cell phone companies think completely differently than we did. What we learned is pain and pleasure. People do more to avoid pain than gain pleasure. Advertising was pleasure. The pain for this, what we did is we went in under what's called customer service. They have a million people behind on their bill. They spend $20 calling them. It's $20 million to call a million people. Hey, we can play this little four-second message. Just pay us two cents. So we're at two cents per message versus $20 a call. That got us out. Why is all this relevant? All of this came down to our advisors who we had built credibility with. Were we ready? We weren't ready. But I took the meeting early and often, went and said, why won't this work? And we completely changed the name of the company, we changed the modeling, we changed positioning because our customer wanted something different than we did. Right? That's what you guys are going to go through is how do you learn what the other person wants, what's in it for them. We still got what we wanted. We're still starting to play messages. We want it to be advertising, they want it to be customer service. We had to switch. So the advisory board, my point here is, not only did they help us, it moved. We were four different types of companies over four years so we figure out where we were. Our advisors, we moved through the system. So these guys can really help you. Sampling of the current advisors, these guys don't matter, but co-founder, participant, former CEO of Lucasfilm Limited, agent for, you know, current former agent. Well, this isn't relevant, guys. The point is you can get to anybody you want to get to. Using the techniques, figuring it out, you can get to who you want, just know who you want to get to, build your names. Experience is the slowest teacher, but it's the greatest, but it's also the slowest. So, read books, learn from other people's failures, go to class, go to school, that's kind of what you guys are doing here. How do you accelerate your knowledge, not make the same mistakes other people do? Where does your road lead? Finishing up, super okay. <clears throat> this I found fascinating. This was in, in, in um, Hawaii years ago. Can you guys see what the sign says? I don't know if you can see it. Road work. It says, expect delays. So as you come up over this hill, here's this big sign, expect delays, and the road kind of curves off. You're like, ah, oh, crap, I'm from LA. What's, how long is this going to take, you know? This is the back road of Hana in Maui. As you go around this curve, there's nobody. <laughs> I mean, we had passing by an hour. As far as you can see, and you're like, okay, so here's this sign, this roadblock. This is what's going on, but if you look, it kind of looks like it drives off into the ocean. So we're thinking, oh, maybe that's the road construction. Does the road end? When you come up right to the edge of the road, as it looks like it's dropping off in the ocean, it's kind of cool. Right when you go down around this bend, that's the view. So I just thought it was interesting. Here's a big sign saying, expect delays, roadblock. Looks like it goes nowhere, and the view when you went around was, was pretty amazing. All right, here's what I'm going to do in closing. Here's my, my favorite little story. Learn to be a hard-hearing frog. Does anybody know the hard-hearing frog story? I'm starting to tell it more and more. And I'm not a good storyteller. Here's how it works. Very simple. Bunch of frogs. Now, again, you guys are, this is Hollywood entertainment, so you can follow me on the story that <laughs> isn't going to make sense because a bunch of frogs don't really go home from work together, but follow me. Frogs are going home from work. They're walking along, hopping along, and a frog falls off the side of the road, and for some reason, again, it's Hollywood, there's a bucket of milk, and the frog falls in the bucket. And he's drowning. He's looking out, and all the frogs are staring down at him going, what are you doing? He's like, help, I can't get out, I'm stuck. And he's flapping and flapping, and the frog's watching for a while. They're finally like, give up. Just quit. You're going to drown. The frog's like, what? He's flapping, and all the frogs are gathering around, and they're laughing at him, trying to get out. They're making fun of him. Just give up. Just quit. You'll never make it. The frog keeps looking, what? What? And he's flapping. And all of a sudden, those of you that are from the south and maybe Virginia, anybody know what happens with milk? When it starts getting churned, it starts getting a little more solid, right? It turns to butter. So he's flapping and flapping, and all of a sudden, it's just solid enough under. He's able to jump out. 
And he hops out of the bucket and comes up the hill, and all the, the frogs are like, oh, my God, you made it. He's like, what? He's like, we thought you were going to die. We can't believe you made it. And he goes, oh, I thought you were cheering me on. Oh. <laughs> Point is, how do you be a hard-hearing frog? People are going to tell you, you can't make it. It's not going to work. You can't win an Oscar. You can't do this. You can't do that. Just realize they're just cheering you on. All right, so you've got to get a different mentality of how you think about things. Um, my last one, what would you do? All right, you guys can guess who this person is. You probably know now he's more famous than, than I won't say he used to be, but what would you do? So here's a guy. He was adopted. His first family didn't want him. He dropped out of college. He was offered a third of his business to his boss. The boss turned him down and fired him. was fired from his own company twice, created several products that failed spectacularly. He was made fun of when they failed was brought back into his company. One, now it's one of the most respected companies in the world. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Family didn't want him, dropped out of college, created things Dr. called the Newton and the Next, which was a tablet device. These things failed. He was made fun of over and over. He was just ahead of his time. He was a hard-hearing frog. He's like, oh, you guys don't know what you want now? You will later. All right? So the, the, the relevance here is find somebody that's a hero. And I'm not saying Adam's your hero, but if he is, figure out what his story is. You know, what did he take to get there? How long did it take? What were the challenges? And go through that and learn what they did so when times get tough, ask yourself, oh, well, geez, I want to be a director. Well, here's the decision in front of me. What would Adam do? And if you get a hero and you learn enough about that hero and their background, then you put yourself in a position to figure out what would that person do in the situation I'm in? What decision would they make? Right? And then just again, this is all about psychology perspective of how to think of things a little differently. Problem with running the rat race is at the end of the race, even if you win, you're still a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Always remember sky's the limit. Again, what do you want the end to look like for you and how do you get there and how do you help people along the way? Success, why not it be me? What do you tell others? Like, What are your beliefs? What are your goals? What are your convictions? Do you really want to win an Oscar if you tell people that? Right, I'll give you an example for us real quick, and I'll tell you what I, I tell people. The, the Wet Rock, this little product I was telling you guys about, it's a box. Guys, it's this simple. It's a box that looks like a treasure chest made out of recycled plastic. It drops in the tank of a toilet to save water. That's all it does, a box and a toilet. And I tell people we're going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. And they, they laugh. They're like, I'm like, no, you don't understand. If 10 million people have a box, we save 45 billion gallons of water, peace, power, conservation. I have a whole story about how we can win a Nobel Peace Prize. Will we ever win one? I don't know. I don't, do I care? Okay. So it's a cool thing I want to try and do, and I want kids to participate in crowdsourcing. It's like we have this whole thing. What's your goals? What's your convictions? And what do people say when you're questioned? And here's what I used to say. People would go, oh, well, Stephen... What if you don't make it? What if you don't have a, a personal worth of this? What if you don't win a Nobel Peace Prize? What if your company doesn't get bigger? I say, guys, here's the deal. If I do make it, I get to change my life forever. I get to do things for my parents, my brother and sister, my niece and nephew. I'll probably have a plane flying all my friends around that I play soccer with. I have schools I would donate back to. I would send anonymous chats. I would do amazing things for other people if I make it. But I might not. You're right. I may fail. And if I fail, I can always go get a job and I'll be just like you. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the people that were always saying, oh, well, what if you don't do this? And I looked at them and I'm like, what's my, I'm having a blast at what we do because it's going after the things I want our life to be like in my life. If I don't make it, the, the job is always there. The people that were telling me not to pursue my dreams didn't have things that I wanted. I found people that have pursued dreams and that's what we're chasing. So it's living your life a little differently. I can always go get a job. Other All right, let me go through these other ones and if you guys have questions, we'll do it. These are just kind of fun ones. These are a few of what I call truce. Truce as I see them. If you guys don't, that's okay. And I've mentioned a bunch of these. First, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. Does anybody know what their greatest strength is? Have you ever thought about it? All right, think about it, guys. Just whatever it is, just kind of think about it. I know what mine is. All right, and I'll tell you what my strength is. I can open any door to get to anybody at any level in any company or any country anywhere in the world. I can get to anybody I want to get to. You're like, oh my God, that's great. Why is it a weakness? Because I don't close the doors. 
to me, the excitement and challenge is getting that introduction to the person I want and getting them excited about what we're doing and then moving on. And in business, there's a difference, a very distinct business be or differentiation between what I call business development and sales. Business development is smoozing in networks, getting introduced, getting people to like and trust you quickly, figuring out how to add value. All of this stuff I do is business development. Sales is closing something over a long period of time. I don't close. Just not the way I'm wired. And even if I wanted to, I'm more interested in the next big target. So I know that about myself. So I've had to surround myself with other people that aren't like me, that are the exact opposite of me, that hate networking, that don't like being out front, but when you give them a task, they get shit done. Because I don't. So strength and weakness. Just figure out what it is and, and understand it's a positive. People do more to avoid pain than gain pleasure. Pain of failure is greater than the pain of success. How do I not fail, right? The, that was my example with the guys from the mobile company. The, the pain for them was the billions they spend on collections and customer service. Pleasure was the advertising, but that was pain because it would piss off consumers. So that was the motivation. People make decisions emotionally and defend them logically. Ask not why, ask why not. Why not it be me? Why not this work? Why not this be the way to do it? And solicit that kind of negative feedback. This is a fun one. If you say it, they doubt it. If they say it, it's true. If you say you're a great director, yeah, yeah. If I say you're a great director, I believe it. It's how do you get other people to say good things about you because that's when it's true. Right? Somebody tells you they're in love. Until you say it, they can tell you they love you all day long. Until you say it, it doesn't matter. You say it, they doubt it. If they say it, it's true. You get other people to say things. Remember the three R's. This, I, I have three R's. Ken and, and some of the other people we know change this to C's. When you're working with people, I'll give you the R's or the C's, and you guys can take either one if you like or throw them out. Maslow's hierarchy of need. The number one thing we're motivated by is recognition. People love recognition. When I can remember Eddie's name or Brian or Dan or anybody, they love recognition. People will kill for a t-shirt. We were in sales training. We didn't give them money. We gave them a t-shirt on stage in front of 500 people cheering them on. Kill for recognition. So when people are helping you, sometimes just giving them recognition for helping you is enough motivation. Another thing is referrals. If you help somebody, give them referrals. How can they help you? And revenue meaning if you're in deals with somebody, sometimes there's money. You know, find ways to compensate people if you can. So the three R's, recognition, referrals, revenue. If you like three C's, it's kind of the same thing. Credit, give people credit for an introduction. Give people credit for helping you. That's why IMDB is all about credit. All IMDB is a list of accomplishments saying, hey, look at all the stuff I've done. Aren't I important? Or give them contacts to help them with their business or give them compensation. Those are the three C's or the three R's. Questions are the key to the universe. Begin with the end in mind. That's where we started the whole thing. What's your goals? What do you want to be? He who speaks first loses. <laughs> right? This one's good, especially for negotiation. Right? If you guys are ever in a, a negotiation, if you're in sales, if you're asking questions, right? if we're going back and forth, Dan, right? Yeah. Dan and I are negotiating, and I say something like, all right, Dan, this is what we're doing, and we need $6 million to make it happen. That's my question. That's my comment. That's my close. And you ask your question and you shut up. Sure. And it can get uncomfortable. <laughs> and that silence is your friend. If you ask a question and then you wait, right? We're, we all have to ask these questions. There's going to be big questions you have to ask. I want more money in my job. I don't want that title. I want this one. When you ask, just be quiet and let the other person speak first. Because what will happen is it will get uncomfortable and you crumble. Well, I don't really need six million. We could do it for five and a half. Well, you know, you crumble. So just try and have the fortitude. When you ask a question, wait. And then the other one, I, I don't have it on here, but I'm going to for, for, for this one. He speaks first, loses. I'm going to add another one to you real quick. This, guys, if you remember nothing else, years from now when you use this technique, send me a check. I'm going to teach you everything you need to know about negotiations. Ready? It's called the flinch factor. Brian and I are 
or buying a car, right? I'm, I'm selling a car, it's $10,000 for my car. Or 15, or 20, or 50, or 100, you know, it doesn't matter, simple number. $10,000, each car. Brian comes in, Brian, right? Brian comes in, offers me $10,000 for the car. Offer me $10,000, Brian. I'd like a car $10,000. Great, you got it, it's yours. This is what happens, psychology. What do you think goes through Brian's mind if he's honest with himself and thinks about it? Because I didn't hedge, flinch, anything. The minute I said 10000 it's yours. What do you think happens? He's he's like like a could have got it for less. Yeah. What's wrong with it? Why didn't he? Just because I didn't do anything, our mind is instantly like, what's wrong? I could have got it for less. Watch this one. Offer me again, Brian. Here's my car. Offer me $10,000. I would like the car for $10,000. Okay. I have to do it a little differently. I'm sorry. Let's say I want 10 and you offer me 9 and I take it. Right? Same thing. You're going to think you could have got it for less. Here's my example. I want 10. Brian offers me 9. Offer me 9. Uh, I'll take the kind of cover 9. Down. 9. Man. Um, well, I don't. I, let me think about it. That's, you know, that's a lot less than what I want. I, I may have wanted 9 and asked 10 and I don't care. I may have wanted 12. I may have taken. The point is just the flinch. Have you guys seen Pawn Stars? You know the Pawn Star stuff? <laughs> you, you haven't seen the show, Pawn Stars? Yeah. A couple times. You have to watch it. It's it's you think these guys don't know what they're doing. The psychology of what they're doing. Guys offer something, right? He who speaks first loses. Are you trying to pawn that or sell it? The guy's like, I want to sell it. What do you want for it? So he asks, and then they shut up. Well, and you watch these people, they get interviewed outside. I'm gonna take a thousand dollars for that pen. And then they're standing in front of the table, and the guy's like, what do you want? I'll probably take 800 So, bar set. The guy's like, 800 Man, I'm thinking like four. And they start negotiating. And they say, I'm thinking four, and they shut up. And they stand there, and they look at the other guy, and the guy cross starts sweating. He's like, well, you know, will you do six? Yeah, you know what? I can do six. You would have paid eight. It's all in how you answer the question. So learn how to flinch because that makes the other person feel better even if the decision was what you wanted. All right? The psychology. Just learn to flinch. You'll Trust me, you will make lots of money on that one and you'll look back and laugh. 99% of the things you worry about never happen, so why worry? A lot of things are beyond our control. Don't worry about them. Worry about what you can control. That's the bonus slide. And then the last one is... Networking, and you guys can think I'm weird on this one. Again, this is a lot of networking. Here's my tips for networking. We do a lot of conferences. We do a lot of things. Before I go to an event, I just did this. I flew to Chicago. I was at an event. It was a friend of mine's house. He had 80 people there. I don't know who these people are. So I found him in the corner, Rex, and I walk up to Rex and I'm like, all right, Rex, who should I meet? Oh, well, gee, let's. We stood back and strategized who was in the room. He's like, well, this is so and so. He runs ComEd. This guy was head of this company. This guy's got a billion dollar beverage company. This, and he's pointing out the five, six, seven people I need to meet. So I went tactically to the host and said, who do I need to meet? How can I meet these people? What do they do? So now I had a point of reference. That one's cool, fun, and easy. This one's a little creepy if you do it wrong, <laughs> but it's brilliant if you do it right. <laughs> Have you guys seen an event where people are up on the panel, right? And there's a bunch of people in the audience and when the panel's over, the guy walks to the end of the stage, and what happens to everybody that wants to talk to him? They line up. They all line up. So the guy's talking, yeah, yeah, and, he's, you know, and he runs out of cards and doesn't want to give them. And you're 15 people in line, waiting, moving up like a little drone. There's somebody in front of you and somebody behind you, and you are wasting your time. What I do, the guy's at the end, I walk up, and I stand next to him. Off to the side. So he's here talking, and all these people are lined up, and I'm just... You know, I might stand this way, or I might stand, but I'm standing next to him, here's why. I'm listening to what his answers are. The 10 or 15 people before me are asking him enough questions, and I'll learn what's important to the speaker. I'll learn how he answers it, so I can answer my questions better when people are asking me. I learn what's important, so when I talk to him, I've already heard 10 or 15 or 20 answers. The other thing I do is I now know what 15 or 20 people in the room do. So when these people were all pitching the speaker on what they do, I'm standing there going, oh, that's what Eddie does. All right, I need to meet him. Oh, that's what Dan does. Okay. I can just be efficient by standing there and learning what people in the room do and the speaker. And you get a lot more done at the end. 
do your homework in advance if you know you're going to go to an event. I send an email out a lot of times, hey, I'm going to this event, here's a list of speakers. If you know anybody, let me know. And I end up getting introduced to speakers and panelists and people who I wouldn't know on my own. And it separates me when I'm there because I've already got an introduction, so I'm not one of the people standing in line. Look for the person that's the most popular at the event. If you can't do any of these things, this is the difference between what I call a puppy dog and a hawk. Right? Networking people, find the puppy dogs. Anybody know what a puppy dog is? You guys, puppy dogs run around, and shake their tail, and sniff. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's networking guys that are just talk. I don't talk to everybody. I'm like trying to find three people I, I want to talk to. But I have friends that are puppy dogs that I take with me to events. Hey, John, go talk to that guy over there. Oh, hey, those guys are in. Go find out what they're doing. And I send the little puppy dog over. <laughs> and I let him talk. You know, so find the most popular person and figure out who they are and what they do and let them know what you do and have them help you. And then send an email in advance. That was the one I just said. So these things will help you if you're going to a job fair, if you're going to a, a digital networking event. If you can get introduced to people in advance, all of this stuff seems, seems to help. Uh, and I think that should be it. So, and this, guys, for if you want it, that's, that's my personal email address. If you want the slides, if you want you know, all of the, the tips and stuff, let me know. All right, so other questions? I mean, it's, again, guys, I've tried to kind of cover a lot. Some, I hope, make sense now. Some will make sense in the future, and some will make sense years from now when you're sitting around going, oh, I just flinched in that job offer and I got more money. Okay, now it works. <laughs> yeah, we should have done what Steven said. Oh. That one cost me. I, I didn't learn that one until we, there were two or three deals looking back in retrospect where we had one when I was really, really young. I, we, had, we had a number in mind for what we thought our company was worth. The guy came in and offered more. Or no, he, what were we doing? We had a number for what we thought it was worth to spin it out and sell it. This guy came in and offered less, which was a good thing, meaning we had to pay less for the company. And he gave me that number, and I'm like, oh, cool, done. I signed the paper. I didn't flinch. And the minute I didn't flinch, I, we looked back in retrospect. The guy's like, oh, well, you know, we still need to talk to the attorneys. We, because I didn't flinch on the number, he knew he was offering less than what, it was, what we needed. My number was higher. If I would have flinched, we would have got a lot more out of it. So I learned some of these things in hindsight. I can look back and dissect things that didn't work. The flinch factor is a good one. Other questions? Cool. Just curious. Yeah. When you're networking yourself, like, what do you tell people that you do? Because you entrepreneur so many different mm -hmm. businesses. It, 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 again, it depends on, on your background. So if you're <laughs> more interested in entertainment, I may talk about Orion Nation, which is our celebrity platform. Awesome. Um, I may talk about, there's a new one we're doing called Magma, which is a little magazine moment. We're doing photo sharing apps. So I may talk to you about photo sharing if I know you're in, in there. If you're in finance, I, I may talk to you about one that I think is relevant to you based on what kind of things you finance. Like we deal with investors. Investors are in different stages. Do you do early? Do you do seed? Do you do enterprise? Do you do mobile? Do you do entertainment? Oh, you don't do any of those things. Okay, well, what do you do? What do you, so... I can answer my questions because I generally find out as much as I can or more about the person I'm talking to. So you try to deflect first. Okay. Yeah, I deflect first. And that, that again lets you be a slasher. I'm a, I'm a massive slasher. I'm not a writer, producer, director. That I'm, you know, we're mobile, we're enterprise software, we're e-commerce, we're a platform, we're, mobile. we're nine different things. But I can't throw them all up in the air and hope I pick one. So I just ask a lot of questions if I can. And by a lot, guys, this isn't 15 minutes. It's pretty quick. You know. Hey, what do you do? What's your value? Oh, what industries are you in? Who are some of your customers? Who are your clients? Who are you trying to get to? Okay, that's what I need to know. I'm a real big proponent of sharing my mistakes so you guys don't. I was fortunate to be invited into a room in New York. This was probably two or three years ago. Top floor, a guy runs a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, and it was going to be Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and Larry Summers and Chris Hughes, a bunch of people that we all recognize. I'm going to be in the room with about 80 people. The person that was inviting me, I, I stressed very heavily, and I ended up getting the list of people in advance. It took some work, took some doing. He's like, okay, fine, Steven, here's the guest list. So I had, I had 75 or 80 people in advance going in. And I took it to my assistant. I said, all right, let's do this. Let's research. We went to their Wikipedia page. 
We looked at their charities. We figured out what they were important. The guy hosting it loved wine, which had nothing to do with his investing. I know four people that own vineyards that would send them. So I did all of this research in advance. I had a spreadsheet. I had the checks of the 10 to 15 people I wanted to meet. And I walked into the room, and anybody want to guess what I did wrong? No guesses. <laughs> oh, no, I, I didn't even need it because I had done enough, but I still had it. If, if this was my Excel spreadsheet and it was name, company, title, what do they do, philanthropy, I was missing one key ingredient when I'm in a room of a bunch of people with no name tags. Pictures. Pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a room standing there going, these people aren't going to wear name tags. I had no clue who they were. I mean, the, the obvious you know, suspects, the Clintons and Blairs, Rick, the people I wanted to meet, I, I had no pictures. So we had done the research in advance. I'm trying to follow my own techniques, and I walked in, and I'm standing there going, I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> So yeah, just pictures in, in the research and stuff. If you ever do that, just try and find pictures so you can at least halfway find the people. You know? Yeah, kind of mess up sometimes. And, you know, that's why you don't, don't make the same mistakes other people have. So, what okay. else? Other questions? Great. Fantastic. Great, cool. Okay, Thank thanks. you so much.